Okay, we're going to start with chapter 10. We're going to be covering chapters 10, 11, and 12. I'm going to actually do these as three separate lectures because it'll be a little bit easier and you can start and stop it as many times as you like. So let's go ahead and we'll get started. Um, chapter 10, Therapeutic Communication. What is communication? Well, in psychiatric nursing, it is the cornerstone for all psychiatric mental health nursing practice. Um, it is interpersonal communication, of course, that we use or person-to-person -person um, communication that we use in order to establish, maintain, and improve human contact. Um, it's influenced by a multitude of different things. Our perceptions, how we see things, and even how the patient sees them, our own values, the roles that we play. Are we the one that's communicating or are we the one that is listening? Cultures and subcultures, remember that within every culture that there's always going to be subcultures just because that you are the same racial or the same ethnic background does not mean that you may practice everything exactly the same your experiences are going to have a lot to do with your level of communication if you've had a lot of experience in different areas you're going to be more likely to share that if you've been more inexperienced you're going to probably be a little bit less likely to share those kind of things and communication itself are you good at it um, do you enjoy communication Perception. Perception is highly personal and it is an internal act. Um, illusions are something that um, go along with uh, perception. This is um, communication specialists have actually discovered that um, illusions because of our physiologic limitations as humans, the eye and the brain are constantly being tricked into seeing things that are not really what they seem. In your book on page 185, um, figure 10-1 there is an illusion there you stare at that um, illustration for about 20 seconds and as you are staring at it it will appear to be swinging back and forth okay it is the way that your brain is sensing interpreting and even comprehending what you are seeing um, the same thing on page 186 there is a picture of um, a woman and when you look at it, your brain will interpret whether that is a young woman or whether that is an old woman. What, um, when we talk about values, um, we talk about um, what something is worth. Um, what it is worth to an individual. For instance, a car may be a value to you and I, but if you are no longer able to drive, then it's going to have very little value, right? Our values change as we get older. College and work shift values into other um, directions. Our daily roles influence what we value as well. Um, in one day, I'm a teacher. Um, I am a nurse. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a citizen. I'm even a daughter. So my roles change on a regular basis. Culture and subculture or the culture within a culture teaches people actually how to communicate through language, through hand gestures or body language, even the clothing that they wear. Um, and this is done in um, ways that they use the space around them as well. In some cultures, um, belching out loud after dinner is a compliment to the host. Um, in others, not so much, right? The preconceptions of culture are learning at an early age. So we learn our different cultural beliefs, our different values um, from the time that we are born, really. Concepts of understanding. Words mean different things to different people. For example, the word Coke. Coke and Coke can mean two very different things. Um, it can be um, what we call denotative or it can be connotative. If it is denotative, it is a literal or a restrictive meaning of the word in general use by most people who share a common language. If it comes from a person's personal experience, it is called connotative. Um, the word is going to have personal and subjective meaning. In other words, what? How they interpret that, right? We all understand the denotative meaning of pig, but this word may have a negative or positive connotation for farmers, consumers of pork, people of Muslim faith, Jewish people, prisoners, and even police officers. Connotative means meanings can actually provoke very powerful emotions. Um, private meaning. Private meaning is communication that takes place 
and meaning has to be shared. Private meanings can be used to communicate with others only when the parties agree about what the word means. So in other words, they have to have the same meaning. They both have to perceive it or understand it in the same way in order for um, that meaning to work. Like we talk about having a private meaning about different things between you and a friend maybe. Um, then private meanings can become actually shared meanings. We see this when we use medical terminology, when we use slang. Um, teens have um, shared meanings. Adolescents have shared meanings, right? So they become more public. Um, schizophrenic clients oftentimes use language in a idiosyncratic way or they may even use a private or unshared language which we call neoglisms. They may not even be aware that others don't understand this type of language. They'll be talking using these neoglisms and they'll have no idea that we don't understand what they're saying. Sometimes we have to work with clients to be able to understand any of the private words that they have. Um, we certainly don't want to misinterpret a word, a phrase, or a gesture. So what's the best thing to do? Of course, to ask. Nonverbal communication. Um, this is the mechanism in which we communicate using especially body movement. Um, um, in nonverbal communication, um, our voice quality and even our non-language sounds can contribute to this. Um, nonverbal communication often carries more social meaning than spoken words do. People can make inferences about um, you based on your nonverbal communications. Um, for instance, your facial expression your hand gestures, the pitch of your voice, the rate and the volume of your voice. Um, what does that tell us about it? If you're upset, if you're happy, if you're scared. Um, use of personal and social space. Um, touch is another thing. Um, and use of cultural artifacts like your clothing, jewelry that you might have, even cosmetics. Um, the way that you wear them. Do you wear heavy makeup? Do you not wear any makeup? Nonverbal cues actually help us to judge the reliability of the verbal message more easily, especially in the presence of getting mixed messages. In other words, there's an inconsistency between what the person is saying and what the person is actually exhibiting. Yeah, I'm fine today. And their nonverbal um, communication is telling you that they're not fine today, that they're upset or that they're in pain, right? Um, the use to um, column is the verbal and the nonverbal links that we're going to discuss in um, slide 12 coming up here. Well, when we get to slide 12, okay? What about body movement? Watch your facial expressions. Do you, um, you don't want to be judgmental with these clients. You want to make sure that um, that we have not a flat effect, of course, but we want to have a um, um, kind of a non-committal is how I always say. Don't act surprised. Don't look upset. Don't be particular happy. Just have kind of a neutral, um, a neutral way. Um, kines um, kinesics. This is the study of body movement as a form of nonverbal communication. So we can actually look at how a person moves and we can tell about their overall demeanor sometimes. This is also done of course through facial expressions, gestures, and eye movements. Um, remember that some cultures consider direct eye contact as rude. Um, Hispanic cultures usually do not make direct eye contact. Also clients who have been abused um, also are not going to probably make direct eye contact. Be very careful um, in addition to um, this with hand gestures. Hand gestures can actually communicate anxiety, um, not really caring, indifference, um, even impatience among other things, also fidgeting and foot shuffling. These are all things that are included under kinesics that is just about body movement and how we interpret or how we communicate um, with individuals. Voice quality and non-language sounds. Um, when we talk about especially the way that someone talks, we can take away a lot of different meanings, can't we? Um, vocal cues, for instance. Don't you use that tone with me. When I use that tone with my children, they know that they're in trouble. If a patient understands or hears you say something in that tone of voice, 
they're going to assume that they are in trouble or they're going to assume that something is wrong. Active and dynamic people may increase their loudness. When I get excited, yes, the tone of my voice and even the timbre or um, how loud my voice is actually increases. Um, and I even start to talk faster when I'm excited. Um, per, um, persuasive people are going to have um, a greater intonation and they're also going to have our, um, more volume. You may see changes in vocal cues, especially with patients who are bipolar. When they're upset, their voices may get louder. Um, when they're happy, their voices get louder. But especially with bipolars, you will notice a difference, especially in the quality and the pitch and even the range of their voices. Personal and social space are a biggie. Um, all of us have our own ideas about what we're comfortable with as far as personal and social space. This is actually called proxemics. This is the study of space relationships maintained by people in social interaction. You need to make sure that you understand the difference between intimate, personal, social, and public space. Um, pay attention to those verbal and nonverbal cues. Body language determines how much space to use. Um, intimate space is probably um, not going to be ideal unless that patient is hard of hearing. Now. Um, probably, I mean, a lot of these patients, you may even find that social space is probably going to be most common. But a lot of my patients, especially if they are schizophrenic and they're not paranoid, um, their personal space a lot of times happens to be a little bit closer than a lot of um, individuals are normally comfortable with. What about touch? One of the big things about touch is that you need to make sure that touch is not perceived as sexual in nature. If you are a touchy feeling like my a touchy feely person like myself, I a lot of times will put my hand on someone's forearm or will put my hand on their back when I'm talking to them in order to provide comfort. However, with people that are emotionally unwell or people that um, have psychiatric issues, this can very easily be construed as a sexual gesture. So be very careful about that. Do not alienate a client by infringing on the person's right not to be touched. This is something that I have to work on all the time um, because, like I said, for me, that is kind of a natural thing. That is part of the caring that um, I provide as a nurse oftentimes. Particularly, this becomes important if you have a patient that is OCD. Um, patients that are OCD are very germ phobic um, and so they become very uncomfortable with the whole touching issue. This is also important that you watch how um, you utilize touch in a patient who has a history of abuse. Remember I said that cultural artifacts was also another form of nonverbal communication. Um, this sometimes um, may be seen as a disguise. It's usually very personal in nature. It could be um, a wedding ring. It might be a sorority or fraternity emblem. Um, something that um, could set a client off, if, for instance, that has a military emblem, might be military personnel. So be very careful about um, any kind of cultural artifacts that you happen to know, um, notice. Verbal and nonverbal links. Um, a nonverbal cue may actually repeat a verbal cue, but in a different way. Um, tell you the size of the fish, and then they show you with their hands. That fish weighed five pounds, and then they put their hands out to actually show you how big that fish was. It may not be the same, right? Nonverbal behaviors um, may also contradict verbal behavior. They may say one thing and then have um, a different look on your face. And then um, verbal and nonverbal cues actually contradict each other. Um, it's safer to put more, for, more faith actually in the nonverbal cues because they're not truly always cognizant of their um, behavior in the nonverbal cue. Nonverbal messages can actually add or it can modify verbal messages. Um, may say that um, he's a little irritated about waiting, but what does his body language indicate? He is um, seriously ticked off about the whole situation. So we get a better understanding out of nonverbal cues, don't we? Um, certain nonverbal cues can actually um, emphasize verbal cues. Um, shrugging your shoulders when you really don't care about a decision is one of these things, um, especially in trivial things like where do you want to eat lunch or what movie do you want to watch? Shrug your shoulders and say, I don't care. Whatever you want to do is fine. Um, cues can also regulate, meaning that um, 
people um, when they start to talk or when they stop talk um, when they stop talking they give off cues that are usually nonverbal like opening and closing their mouth to indicate they want to turn to speak um, nonverbal cues are also used to substitute for words if someone doesn't want to say something out loud they can give off these nonverbal cues like away from a distance replaces someone saying hello or um, clapping at the end of a performance um, instead of actually saying I really enjoyed your performance is also another form of nonverbal. Symbolic and interactionist model. Um, this relates to interpersonal communication, um, what we think to ourselves when it comes to um, talking to ourselves, communicating to ourselves. Um, the symbolic interactionist model is based on a transactional process. Um, communication is viewed as a simultaneous mutual influence rather than taking turns, right? Um, you communicate with me and then I'll communicate with you where it is simultaneous meaning that as I'm talking that you are listening, taking in what I'm saying and forming communication to say back to me. Um, in communication, some events take place within the participants and some, ta um, some things take place between the participants. Um, transactional approach is actually based on a system sphere, um, theory. In a transactional model of human um, communication, a change in any aspect of the communication system can actually influence all the other elements in the system. Um, on page 191 in your book, you can go back and um, get a little bit more detailed um, information about this. A lot of times you may see things like people running through a series of internal trials in the process of organizing a message. Um, you can tell that they're thinking that they're trying to come up with an answer but that they don't say anything and you can almost like you can when we talk about the wheels are turning that sort of thing people select and they transmit messages that in their view are going to have the highest probability of success I'm going to make sure that I'm going to tell you whatever it is that I think that you'll be most likely to understand even if it's not quite the um, the exact right thing that I'm trying to say. Success is going to depend on both the accuracy and the completeness of the cognitive map and the accuracy and of course efficiency of the intrapersonal and interpersonal feedback loops so how well that you guys are able to communicate with each other. Neurobiogenic um, factors. Brain activity, that's what neurobiogenic factors are, right? Brain activity is actually can be thought of in the term of messages, <clears throat> excuse me, and receptors. Information is going to flow from cell to cell. You're going to have electric chemical charges in this whole process. And the neurobiology of human communication is really complex. And unfortunately, because of this complexity, we don't always understand it, or we don't at least of this time. Therapeutic communication theory. This was um, actually developed by Dr. Jurgen Reusch. Um, communication involves all processes by which one human being influence another. This is what Dr. Um, Reusch thought, um, what he theorized, excuse me. Um, it occurs in four different settings. It can occur in intrapersonal, interpersonal, it can occur in group, and of course in society. Um, he believed that the ability to receive, evaluate, and transmit messages was actually influenced by perception. Evaluation, which is going to involve uh, memory, past experiences, and value systems. And then the transmission, or the way that um, the message is actually um, is sent, the quality of the message. Um, how much information, how fast that you're sending it, um, the efficacy, so whether or not that it's correct, and of course how distinct that it is. Um, he also believed that messages achieve meaning when they are mutually validated or verified between the two parties. So they have to agree. They have to agree on the message that's being sent. They have to both understand um, and receive the message itself. Um, correction through feedback is basic to adaptive healthy behavior and successful communication and this is something that Dr. Royce really felt was important in order for therapeutic communication to occur. There has to be some type of feedback in order for that um, actually to happen. So what's considered successful communication? Well it should be efficient it should be appropriate, it should be flexible and feedback, what, and feedback should be provided. What do I mean by that? 
Efficiency just means that it should be clear. Um, it should be simple and you should be able to um, communicate um, efficiently or at the right time. Making sure that um, when you're talking to an individual that doesn't have a good grasp of medical health jargon that you're not using complex and scientific words because your message is going to be unclear to them. Um, making sure that when patients are distraught that you're not trying to flood them with a whole bunch of information because they're not going to get that. Um, what about appropriate appropriateness? Well, you want to make sure that whatever you are communicating with them is actually relevant to the situation, for one thing. Again, this has a lot to do with um, also the amount of information. Remember that some patients are going to have a higher tolerance for a lot of information than other patients. Patients that are acutely psychotic, you're probably wasting your time giving them a whole bunch of information, giving them simple, straightforward um, um, answers or asking them simple, straightforward questions is going to be the best way to um, effectively communicate with them. Flexibility. Remember that we don't always know how a message is going to be received. Um, and this is mostly because each person is individual, aren't they? The way that they communicate is unique and um, it changes oftentimes with whatever the topic of conversation is. So as a um, healthcare provider, you've got to be flexible. If you are not flexible, um, you are going to become frustrated. You may actually become um, ungratifying or even have your communication with that individual disturbed depending on the amount of frustration that you yourself are experiencing. Um, you may have to actually, because of this flexibility, set new priorities when it comes to communicating with these patients, clients, excuse me. And what about feedback? We know that feedback is what? The response to the message. It's the process by which performance is checked and the things that are wrong are actually corrected, right? Feedback actually lets us know if the person not only received the message, but if they understood the way that it was intended. Um, content that um, we give a person in communication that um, causes them to be anxious or fearful or even shame um, is likely to hamper feedback from them. More often than not, they're going to experience very strong emotions that are going to cause them to want to hold back about that. Behavioral effects in human communication is a theory that was developed by um, Watzlawick, Beaven, and Jackson in 1967 and was based on the assumption that communication is synonymous with interaction. Okay? Um, in order to interact with someone, you also have to communicate with them. There are actually two levels. There's um, a content level, um, which is almost like a reporting aspect in which the information is conveyed. Or the relationship level is the other one, in which communication is about communication. Um, symmetric, we talk a lot about um, symmetric with this um, particular theory. Being symmetric just means that um, that the information is based on equality or it's complementary, can be based on differences. And then of course, um, communication disturbances because communication can be disturbed at times. Um, communication disturbances may be because of um, the person doesn't want to communicate. Um, maybe they communicate in a way that invalidates the messages that are sent or that are received from the other person like contradicting themselves, switching back and forth from subjects, um, incomplete sentences and even misunderstanding what it is that we're trying to communicate to them. Remember that um, persons are going to communicate in a way that either confirms, rejects um, or disconfirms the other person's view of self meaning that if they confirm it, that means that the greatest single factor in, this is the greatest single factor when it comes to ensuring um, especially um, mental health and their development in it and whether or not that they are stable when it comes to mental health. Um, if it disconfirms, if you have disconfirmed type of communication, this is the attitude that you're wrong. This means that they're rejecting the communication. In um, certain situations, this can actually lead to alienation, and it has actually been found to occur with some regularity, especially in patients who suffer from schizophrenia. Um, I can't tell you how many patients that I've taken care of that were schizophrenic in nature, and um, as I am trying to 
gather information about what's going on with them or trying to share um, information with them even if it's something as simple as the time of the day or the day of the week that it is and they will tell me I am wrong that I don't know what I'm talking about it doesn't matter what I tell them they are rejecting that and saying that that's not what they believe and then you can have um, what is actually called runaways. Um, runaways just means that this is exaggeration and it is seen, um, a lot of times we see them exaggerate so much that um, it's to the point of actually disturbing that communication as well. Um, this a lot of times is the kind of um, communication that we see in individuals that are quarreling or having an argument because a lot of times it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, Neuro linguistic programming theory. This was by Bandler and um, Grinder in the 1970s and uses um, central mo modalities that were audio, visual, and kinesthetic. People are going to take in or they're going to access information in one of these three ways. Um, each person is going to prefer one mode or the other. Um, sounds may facilitate communication with one, with one person while sight or even touch may be more effective with another person. Remember that expert communicators are going to be able to adapt and match the client's um, form of um, sensory modality. They're going to be able to um, imitate the client in a natural and respective way. Um, how will you determine their sensor, um, sensory modality? Sometimes it's by um, preferred predicates, the way that they use words. Sometimes it can be eye accessing cues, it can be gross hand movements, or even breathing patterns and the way that their um, the tone of their voice is affected when they speak. Moving on to therapeutic relationships. What's the purpose of a therapeutic relationship? Um, it's to establish um, or excuse me, what's the purpose of therapeutic communication, excuse me, is to establish therapeutic relationships, right? Um, moving from social superficiality to therapeutic intimacy in involves a high level of um, commitment. So if we want to develop a therapeutic relationship with our clients, we first must be able to communicate with them effectively. We want to be able to move from the things that are um, not sensitive or the things that are everyday day-to-day -day things that they talk about with strangers to being able to understand truly what is affecting their overall mental health status. So how do we facilitate empathy, um, intimacy? Well we talked the other day about one of the big things is empathy. It's really important especially um, when it comes to interpersonal um, exploration. These individuals um, have to have our respect as well. Um, it demonstrates that we value the integrity of the client and that we actually have some faith in the client's ability to be able to solve problems, um, especially if they're given appropriate help. Um, giving advice actually um, conveys a directly opposite message. So this involves a lot of um, listening, doesn't it? Um, genuineness. Um, this is the ability to be real or to be honest with each other, right? Um, it has to be properly timed and it should be based on a solid relationship. This is not something probably that uh, that individuals are going to jump right into the first time that they see them. Honesty is not always the best policy no matter what they tell you, especially if it is brutal or if the client just simply isn't capable of dealing with it at that particular time. Immediacy is responding to what is happening between the client and yourself, especially in the here and now. Difficulty um, exists with this because it involves the feeling of the client towards you. If you are open, if you're reasonable and you're concerned, the relationship is likely to be strengthened. On the other hand, if you are not, you're going to have a hard time being able to facilitate an intimate, more intimate type of relationship with them. Warmth is very closely linked to empathy and to respect and it is seldom communicated as an inter as an independent dimension excuse me don't confuse being chatty or being buddy buddy um, behavior with warmth warmth is often conveyed in communication of respect and empathy remember to respect the clients right to maintain distance warmth and intimacy cannot be forced you have to really feel that way
So what are some of the skills that you're going to have to have in order to be able to provide therapeutic communication? Um, turn off the TV, turn off the radios. Um, you may have to get out of a loud room in order to be able to provide their communi um, therapeutic communication before anything else. Um, if they have a hearing aid, make sure that it's working properly. You may have to move closer to them because of this. Um, speaking to the client's good ear, make sure that um, the environment is quiet, like I said initially. Place yourself so that the client can see you. This is important so that they can see the reactions. Um, on your face, make sure that um, the client can see your lips so that if they do have a hard time um, that they will be able to um, read your lips if that's the case. Most people that are hard of hearing, a lot of times that's exactly how they communicate is they're able to do um, a certain amount of lip reading. Speak at a natural rate. Do not slow down unless the client does not understand and they'll tell you that if they don't understand what you're saying. Therapeutic empathizing. Don't listen to your clients without empathy. Um, during detachment, use the um, insight that you've gained from reverberation phase as well as reason and objectivity to offer responses that are going to be useful to the client. Um, when you are um, incorporating uh, incorporation when it comes to therapeutic empathizing, you are actually taking in the experiences of the client. Um, rather than attributing our own experiences and feelings to the client. Is it okay for you to say to the client um, that something similar happened to you? Sure, but don't go into detail. This isn't about you, right? Um, remember that I said that. Um, reverberation, again, it, or I didn't explain in reverberation, excuse me. This is interplay, the internalized feelings of the client and our own experiences or even fantasies. Uh, we still experience ourselves as separate personalities. And then detachment is withdrawing from the subjective involvement and totally resuming our own identity. So during detachment, make sure that you use the insight that you have gotten from the reverberation phase as well as being able to reason and be objective to offer responses that are going to be useful to that client during that process. Active listening. Active listening for a lot of people is difficult. Active listening is just that. It is listening and it is doing it actively. It is not providing responses every third word. It is truly letting the patient talk or the client. Make sure that when you are listening that you are minimizing any kind um, of distractions that could be going on. For instance, um, there are a number of things that as listeners that can cause us to be ineffective listeners or what we um, call blocks to being able to listen. One of them is called rehearsing. This is where that we're planning what we're going to say next instead of actually listening. We're thinking through this in our mind and it's obvious that we're not paying attention. Being concerned with ourselves, um, our intelligence, our level of competence, the feelings that we have about our own um, accomplishments can actually cause us to be ineffective listeners. Assuming Assuming um, that we think we know what the client really means, um, when in actuality we probably don't. Judging, um, taking what we hear or what we see and actually judging that client as being wrong or maybe we think they're immature, or anxious, even paranoid or depressed. This is not employing active listening. Um, identifying is another block that occurs sometimes with listening. Um, focusing on our own similar experiences. Remember I mentioned this um, last slide. Uh, feelings or beliefs when what the client says actually triggers your own memories or concerns. And instead of listening to what they have to say, we turn it around and start to focus on us. Getting off track, um, changing the subject or making light of it, especially because you're uncomfortable or maybe you're bored or you're just sick of listening to them. And then filtering, which is a block that we utilize to tune out certain topics or only hearing things that um, certain things because maybe it increases the level of anxiety um, that we have regardless of what else is being said. therapeutic communication skills um, using silence a lot of individuals are very uncomfortable with this um, but silence can be therapeutic and it actually can encourage the client to actually communicate more it allows them time to think about what they are actually going to say um, you can break any uncomfortable um, 
silences if they go for too long just because it helps to avoid any anxiety on their part. Um, reflecting um, is another communication skill that we need. It's repeating the client's verbal or the nonverbal message um, for the client's benefit. For example, um, reflect contact basically repeats the client's statement to give them a chance to hear and mull over what they have said. So what you're telling me is that you're angry at your mother for having committed you um, to um, the psychiatric ward. Um, reflecting feelings um, is another um, form of reflecting. Verbalizing the implied feelings in the client's comment. Um, saying, talking again about anger. Um, so what you're telling me is that you're angry or what you're telling me is that you are frustrated. Um, respect the client's right to his or her opinion. And remember that um, they are still their feelings even if you happen to disagree with them. Imparting information actually helps the client by supplying additional data. Um, don't withhold useful information and don't reply, what do you think? To an information seeking question. So if you're trying to get a specific answer out of them, you need to be clear about that. Um, don't cross the line between giving information and giving advice. Um, tell them the facts, give them the knowledge, but you don't um, give them what you feel like is what they need to hear as far as, like we said, advice. Um, you want to impart effective education that will actually empower that patient and, of course, their families. Um, avoid self-disclosure. We've talked about this several times. It is not about us. Um, use honesty. Um, I don't share my address with clients. I'm sorry. Or use benign curiosity. Um, I wonder why you're asking me this today. Use refocusing. Saying to them, you were talking about how your father treats you. I wonder why you changed the topic. You were saying that and then try to redirect them. Um, using interpretation, I notice that every time you talk about your father, you change the subject and then you ask me a question. Seeking clarification, you may, you keep asking me questions about my home address. I wonder what concerns that you might have about me today. Um, and then responding with feedback and then limit setting. I'm really uncomfortable when you ask me who pays my tuition. Talking about my finances isn't part of our agreement to work together. Um, adding, the last time we met, you were deciding if you were going to call your boss on the phone. Actually helps to restructure or to rede um, redirect the situation. Clarifying is what we use in an attempt to understand the basic nature of a client statement or to ask the client to give an example to clarify meaning that will help you understand better. Paraphrasing is just a, um, restating in your own words what the client has just said. It helps you to be able to test your own understanding of what the client is trying to say. And if that there is some part of it that you've misunderstood, then the client can clarify that for you. Um, checking perceptions. This is sharing how one person perceives and hears another. This is really important um, when it comes to nonverbal communication. Questioning, um, this is a very direct way of speaking with your clients. Use open-ended questions, especially when you want to give the client um, the client freedom of response. Asking closed-end questions, clients can answer yes or no, um, limits the client's response. But it may be helpful when the um, clients have disorganized thinking. Don't ask clients questions that steer their answer. You don't smoke, do you? All right. few more um, structuring. This is an attempt to create order or to evolve guidelines. It helps the client actually become more aware of the problem and the order in which the client might deal with them. This is good use when clients have a number of concerns in a very brief period of time and they have um, little idea really where to begin. So kind of addressing the things that are most important and going from there. Pinpointing, this is actually calling attention to certain kinds of statements and relationships. Um, sometimes using pinpointing can help you to um, pinpoint, for lack of a better word, inconsistencies among statements. Um, it can also help you to um, see differences in things like points of view or feelings or the actions of even two more people. 
Linking, this is responding to the client in a way that actually ties together two events, like linking past experiences with your current behavior. You felt depressed after the birth of both of your children and how they're feeling now, right? Um, giving feedback, telling the other person your reaction to what he or she has said. It helps the client actually become aware of how their behavior affects others. Um, whether it upsets them, makes them nervous, makes them angry. Um, effective feedback should be immediate, but not in a way that threatens a client or results in increased defensiveness. You want them to hear what you're saying, and if you are defensive about it or if you are angry about it, that is going to completely negate the whole purpose of your being able to provide feedback to them. Confronting, um, sometimes we have to use confronting because oftentimes this will lead to what we call productive um, change. It's where we use a deliberate invitation to examine some aspect of their personal behavior. Um, it may indicate a discrepancy between what the person says and what the person does. Be very careful when you use confrontation and pay attention to the nonverbal communication. Um, you can do informal confrontation, which actually um, describes the visible behavior of another person, or you can do what we call interpretive confrontation, which expresses thoughts and feelings about the other's behavior and draws inferences um, or ideas about the meaning of their behavior. You can use summarizing, which summarizing actually highlights the main idea that's expressed in an interaction. It shows the client that you understand. Um, it is, um, don't rush to summarize before the client is finished speaking. Um, wait until you're sure that they're done and then um, summarize everything that you have or that they have said to you and go back and um, clarify. And then processing. Um, processing is complex and it is sophisticated. Um, it is processing comments um, and paying direct attention to the interpersonal dynamics um, between the nurse and the client. Um, it is um, will be in the content of feelings and behaviors being expressed. It's useful. What are some of the common mistakes that we make in um, providing therapeutic communication? Giving advice is a big one. Um, when we give advice, a lot of times it is telling the client that they are incapable of solving their own problem. Uh, minimizing their feelings is another way. Um, this is actually telling the client that they're overreacting. And maybe that we think that there's nothing for them to be afraid of or to worry about. Um, and these are attempts at reassurance to us, but to the patient, it actually minimizes and it even discounts the patient's or the client's feelings. Deflecting, this is hearing clients express their pain, um, or, well, let me rephrase that. Um, let's say that a patient is discussing their pain, not their physical pain, but maybe their emotional pain with you. And when they do this, a lot of times it can actually increase their anxiety levels. Um, changing the subject or actually making a joke um, is an attempt to move to something less painful. So the patient would deflect, right? You're asking them about, um, about maybe aspects of their childhood because you know that there was some abuse that went on. And because they're nervous about it or anxious about it, they will um, either make a joke or they'll um, attempt to move into something else um, that isn't as painful for them. Um, interrogating. Um, a lot of patients feel like they're being interrogated when we ask them a whole bunch of questions. If you ask lots of questions all at one time, it actually implies that you're more interested in gathering information than you are in actually listening to the client. And we do have to gather a lot of um, questions, don't we? But be very careful because although we look at it as understanding the patient better, it may come off to them as that we are actually interrogating them. And then sparring. Um, no matter what the client says, you know better. That's what sparring is. Um, debating or disagreeing um, with the client is going to prevent you ultimately from listening to them and you are not going to get anywhere um, as far as establishing therapeutic communication. All right, one last thing. Remember cultural sensitivity. Think about etiquette. Um, use the proper form of address for a given culture. Um, make sure that if you are referring to someone that is um, Hispanic that you call them 
Hispanic or um, you don't refer to them as Mexicans or you don't refer to them as um, well or it's most certainly derogatory but make sure that you use proper form um, know the ways by which um, people from other cultures welcome one another in other words how do they speak to each other for the first time do they shake hands do they embrace each other um, and know too when physical contact is absolutely prohibited be aware of when smiling actually indicates friendly, um, friendliness or in some cultures it may be considered taboo remember that um, eye contact you may have you may have eye contact with some cultures some you will not um, eye contact a lot of times um, can actually be a sign of respect like is in Americans or with a Hispanic culture a lot of times they see this as disrespectful or even a, a type of aggression remember that gestures do not have universal meaning so be very careful about using gestures all right that is it for chapter 10 and we will move on to chapter 11